Welcome everyone uh, to tonight's Civic Academy on uh, Community Centres. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting tonight on stolen land. Um, so wherever we are across Queensland, uh, we're on Aboriginal land. Uh, I'm here in South Brisbane uh, on the lands of the Yagara and Turbal people. And I'd invite you all to just take a second to um, acknowledge the owners where you are and put in the chat um, who the traditional owners are. So just by way of introduction, my name is Emily Kane. I am a community organiser with the Queensland Community Alliance um, and will be kind of chairing this Civic Academy this evening. Um, there are also a few other Alliance um, organisers on the call uh, and Gillian Marshall-Pierce from the Logan East Community Neighbourhood Association who will be speaking about community centres this, this evening. Um, and the aims of these kind of academies are um, to develop the technical and policy knowledge among Alliance leaders and within the institutions that are part of the Alliance. Um, we're going to build on our marine print vision and principles for Queensland reconstruction, um, which my colleague Devitt will be talking about in just a second, uh, and to kind of increase the ambition and imagination around public policy. So like what is actually possible um, and how can we imagine a better society together for Queensland? So this is what we're hoping to do. Uh, and to kind of achieve those aims, we've built an agenda where we'll kind of go through some context uh, with Devitt. Um, we're going to break out groups to meet one another a bit more and share some stories. Uh, we'll hear a story from Anne Somerville uh, about her experience using neighbourhood centres. We'll then hear from Gillian Marshall-Pierce who um, runs a community centre. Then we'll talk to one another again to kind of digest the content and get to get to pull it apart a little bit and think about solutions. Uh, and then we'll hear about what are the proposed policies that we're taking as the Alliance um, to negotiate with our state leaders. So my name is Devitt Kennedy. I'm the lead organiser for the Queensland Community Alliance. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if people know what an accordion is? Play like this. Um, Excellent. Um, so, um, going to use that um, image just to set the scene a little bit here. Um, here's an accordion um, for those who are not sure. So, um, we often say that community organising is like playing an, an accordion. You know that you you go you go way out and then in, and it's in the back and forth movement that the that the music is created and that the the development of what we're trying to achieve in civil society is created. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we listen to really wide groups of people and then we have often a, a small group that puts together solutions um, and it's discerned by a, a larger group whether we, whether, whether we can act on that or not and then back out to a really large group to, to take public action. Um, similarly, we, we have big visions that we, you know, go wide on the accordion we were talking last week about our vision of democracy and the role of civil society in building a strong democracy. But often the way to achieve that comes down to the small, uh, you know, seemingly small element of particular funding for community centres. Or, you know, one of my one of my favourite stories around community organising is from our sister alliance in Cardiff, in Wales, where um, the alliance acted to get the one Nando's in Cardiff to um, to have halal chicken. Um, so the, we've got these big visions and ideas, but in the practice they're, they're, they might be really small particular things or medium sized things. And um, so I guess I wanted to just set that as a, as a context for how the scope and scale of, of organizing has a really quite a breadth and looks different at different times because I want to talk through um, the big vision that we've laid out this year, the, the Maroon Print for Queensland Reconstruction, um, and then transition us from that into the, I guess, the medium-sized picture, um, which is us leading into it, into the state election. Um, so um, I will um, I'll get that accordion off my screen now, let you see each other's faces again. <laughs> So um, we know that a lot of decisions, major decisions are being made um, in this with COVID and hopefully moving into eventually a post-COVID period that uh, uh, 
will have significant impact on the future of um, of our health and um, our economy and the way that we see ourselves as a society. And our um, our alliances saw that that was important for civil society to to have an organised presence in that um, in the in the way that those decisions were being made. And when we look back at history, we we see that there's um, there's examples, especially when we look to uh, after World War II and the, the post-war reconstruction in, in Australia, there's a really strong example of the idea that we needed to not just win the war, but win the peace. Um, that was an idea that came from civil society, from churches and unions and community organisations, and then was taken up by political leadership, that, that, that this moment after World War II needed to be used to, to, to transform society and to have a range of social and that was put forward by civil society. It was taken up by political leaders um, and civil society held um, both sides of politics to, to account in a way that meant that that consensus, that broad consensus on, on, uh, on, the, on the approach after, after World War II really underpinned uh, a generation of changes that were implemented by, by both sides of politics. And so we're looking to do a similar type of thing um, here with what we, you know, what we would say that our Maroon print has a win the peace type of strategy. Um, so it's it's broad. We're trying to define the broad middle grounds of what is what is acceptable. Um, so the the Maroon print sets out an agenda with a vision and nine practical principles around that that we've then taken to. The premier and the opposition leader. Um, we have fair, we have commitments to those principles from from the leader of the opposition, and we're and we're working on the premier. Um, so uh, it's it's broad. It's trying to define the broad middle ground of politics um, so that it can underpin a consensus. And it is um, we have we have organisations representing more than two million Queenslanders signed up to that vision. Um, so that is. Uh, are just under half of Queensland's population. Um, that agenda needs to be grounded in people's people's institutions, the places that we can listen to each other, where we come together in churches and in community centres, in ethnic associations, in unions, um, where we where we listen to each other and respond, but also where we have the ability to develop organising muscle, the ability to act. Um, and then we believe it's important that it's negotiated publicly. So it's not just about a, a different groups having a conversation with their own um, preferred party behind closed doors, but that we negotiate these things publicly. And that it be sustainable for the long term. So it's not just about the decisions for the next month or for this state election, but it's about uh, sustaining that for the long term, that, that different consensus. So that's that's the maroon print. That's what we've uh, we've spent a lot of time working on that so far this this year, as people's minds have turned to with COVID and post COVID reconstruction. Um, but then, I guess in our accordion, um, the way that that's implemented means that we need to we need to put forward quite specific things before this election, um, where so that we can use this moment of democratic accountability to get commitments from both parties. And so, um, um, so the election is an important moment, even though it's, it's not the whole thing and we want to be sustainable for a longer term. Um, and so at the, at the moment we've based on listening to over 2000 people's stories, people sharing those, those stories in relational conversations, um, we've developed particular, um, asks heading towards the state election, particular policy proposals. And tonight we're going to look in detail at, at the second one of those around community centre funding. Um, so I guess in these um, civic academies, it's really important that um, we have the medium sized group of people that are not just in our leaders council, they're not just the heads of organisations or the person whose job it is to be across political proposals, but people like most of you who are here, who are leaders in your organisation in various levels, 
uh, are committed to the values of those those organisations being lived publicly. Getting together and being able to work out um, how do those values apply in this situation? So how do they apply in particular around building sustainable community centres that can be the backbone of the community infrastructure of the 21st century? Um, and so I guess that's what we're doing tonight and that's what we're doing in, in each of these in those different subject areas is trying to have the trying to have the level of understanding where, you know, when, when Marion goes to mass on Sunday and she says, come along, people should get involved in acting on these issues, um, she can answer people's questions. And that when, you know, Kim is uh, speaking to nurses and midwives in their workplace um, about their involvement in, you know, in, in changing the broader community, not just their industrial issues, um, that that she's able to share some of the analysis of why this is a this is a priority, um, and if we do that, then we're able to genuinely negotiate with the with the political decision makers, the premier and the opposition leader and others, because we're not just parroting a line, we're not just saying what someone um, up the tree has told us is our script, but we've actually engaged in the 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 substance of these policy areas to be able to understand them. So um, that's the idea of the Civic Academies. That's how it fits the big, the big part of the accordion play with the maroon print. And then I guess the, 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 the medium part that, we, that we're looking towards the election um, and, this, and this particular moment or this particular focus around community centres um, as, as the focus of tonight um, when we zoom in the accordion and then take it back out. I'd like to now invite and some of it all from Logan East Community Neighbourhood Association um, to share her story and experience uh, with community centres. Oh, I've, I've just been asked to um, to um, so say why I'm personally committed to um, the value of community centres and I'd like to also outline my frustration at the low priority our government's giving to adequate funding of community centres. Um, my name is Anne Somerville and I live in Shaler Park and I volunteer at the at Lechner, the Logan East Community Neighbourhood Centre. I was a full-time teacher for over 40 years and I retired in 2015. Lechner became my lifeline when I began to feel socially isolated and lacking in a real purpose. I realised I had started losing my identity and I was no longer the respected teacher who interacted with many, many people every day. I started to feel like the anonymous little old lady who went shopping for something to do, sat in coffee shops, watching the world go by and waiting until after school bell so I could pick up grandchildren. Um, after a, a, a while, I decided to get my involved in, self involved in community and issues and I, I started working over at Lechner. I got a new lease on life. I have met others who have faced similar feelings of isolation and loneliness. Um, and those people who've benefited from the social activities that are offered at community centres and um, like myself have benefited personally from taking on volunteer roles. I've also been impressed by the services and support given by community groups and community centres in particular to the battlers living amongst us. When you're working full time, you just don't realise what's going on in the community, how many good people there are volunteering and helping. Um, at our centre, we also provide um, emergency relief, uh, low interest loans, no interest loans, financial advice, mentoring, life skills programs, and training for people who've been long-term unemployed through skilling Queensland. I really feel we make a, a big contribution to the community and we save the government a lot of money. Um, through my involvement with the management committee, I've actually, at Lechna, I've actually become aware of the financial pressures that community centres um, are under trying to provide these services while we're saving the government money. There's a constant need to raise funds uh, through fundraising activities such as in garden clubs and um, selling secondhand clothes and um, bingo, 
and then you're constantly applying for grants, constantly having to watch the budget, um, robbing Peter to pay Paul, as they say, um, if some funding doesn't come through for something you want to do. So you've got to take it from somewhere else. And there's always the uncertainty of the ability to be able to continue providing services if the grants dry up because, you know, you have to wait until the government says, oh, yeah, you can continue that. You know it's valuable, but you have to wait till they say, give you the tick of approval. And I know in the past some centres have lost um, the money for programs that they wanted to do. It's frustrating to know that community centres are playing such a valuable role in our community and also facing this uncertainty about their ability to continue programs if money dries up. So I really support um, Queensland Community Alliance become getting involved in trying to help our community centres. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, so now that we've kind of heard a bit more of the, the personal experience and, and the, the side that Anne can talk about, I'd like to hand over to Gillian Marshall um, to talk more about like what are community centres, what do they do and what challenges are they facing um, today? Hi everyone, uh, thank you Emily and thank you Anne for sharing a bit more about LECNA specifically. Um, I guess I want to, while I work for the Logan East Community Neighbourhood Association, it's one of 124 funded community centres in Queensland. Uh, and I've been working on looking at what are the common, uh, common elements of community centres, because they are certainly not one size fits all. Um, but I think there are a number of common things that they do deliver. And one thing that uh, I think is important to remember with community centres is they are essentially zero to twilight. While you come across community centres that might have a bit of a focus on youth or on seniors or on different things, they are supposed to be there for all community members to access and connect in with. And we often talk about a soft entry point. So if you think of people who are experiencing domestic and family violence, who maybe have a substance, uh, substance misuse um, challenge or issue, um, in their lives, they're in financial hardship, um, they, you know, have relationships issues, whatever it is, um, it can be a kind of soft entry place for them to come into and get the support that they need. So some of the broad areas that community centres uh, work in is meeting people's immediate needs and service navigation. So as a place for people to come, offload what's going on for them and get some referrals either internally within a community centre or externally to seek support for their what's immediately in front of them um, and faced by them in terms of their challenges. Another, um, another thing that um, Anne referred to which is I guess just I would say probably every community centre does is creating a sustaining social connection and inclusion. Um, there's a reason why in the UK there's actually a Minister for Loneliness, I think. Um, social isolation is a massive challenge and the flow on impact effects that that can have on communities and on families is, is really big um, and underrated, I think. And I think the challenge as well is that this is such in, integral work to community centres, but it's often not very well um, measured in terms of the impacts of programs that, uh, that uh, you know, deal with this issue. But most, I would say most community centres work in the space of providing opportunities and space for social connection. Um, and mentioned, you know, we've got a Queen Bee's craft group, um, card playing groups, you hear of men's groups, craft, gardening, choir, uh, yoga, all sorts of things that can be offered in a community centre. And, it's all the more strengthened, but if they are the initiative of a local community member, which is in the case of Lechner, that's the case. Local community members have come to us saying, hey, I love art. I want to teach art to other people. Um, I love craft. Can I start a group? Um, that kind of thing. Skills development and family engagement. So uh, Anne referred to Skilling Queenslanders for Work. That is a program or other similar programs that can be delivered to community members to upskill and 
uh, give them the opportunity to uh, gain some knowledge and experience and either for further employment. Many uh, community centres offer programs, say, around parenting. There's, you know, circle of security, anger management courses, one, two, three magic, uh, all that kind of, all those kind of um, resources that really expand people's knowledge and experience. And I guess adding tools to their tool, be tool belt for life <laughs> in terms of, you know, how they manage their relationships with others and their communication. Um, building financial and e economic inclusion. Uh, so this is a big one at Lechner. We're a bit of a financial hub and there are many other community centres that do this. So we do do emergency relief. Um, we do see emergency relief as an excellent opportunity for us to have a conversation with people. We Every time someone comes through our doors for food package, vouchers, etc., we do a budget with them. We have a conversation about what support they need. They are often referred through to a financial counsellor um, if they need it, because it's obviously a demonstration that, you know, there's kind of financial issues going on for them. Um, because, you know, I think for all of us working in the community centre, our ultimate goal is to put ourselves out of a job. So we want to, you know, our catch cry at Lechner is to build better lives. And so we want to see people um, g gaining the skills and experience and resilience to not have to come back to emergency to get emergency relief. Uh, we also offer low and no interest loans at Lechner. Not all community centres do that, but um, many do deliver that kind of program. Um, and some centres might not do a Skilling Queenslanders for Work program, but in recognition of that goal of empowering people to gain independence, they might offer computer skills courses or other English class, English language classes. Um, so, you know, free access to computers so people can come and work on their resumes to, you know, find sustainable employment. Um, and then the other one, and a, it's an important big one, is community development and advocacy and community voice. So center, community centres do have a history of delivering community development. And I think there has been a bit of a shift in terms of the funding models of how community centres are funded, which can I just say in Queensland is massively underfunded <laughs> comparative to other states. Um, uh, the baseline funding is not enough to cut, cut what they need to do to deliver to community. Um, but there is really that importance of all community centres doing community engagement to assess what the needs are of their local community. This is place-based work, so they really need to understand the demographics and um, the challenges and experience, the census data. I was poring over census data when I first started at Lechna to understand the community of, of you know, what's around us and what their challenges and needs are, and then engage community in terms of kind of problem solving around those needs. Not just doing it, but actually working with community, um, creating the space for community to problem solve and take initiative. And that's what community development is all about. Um, part of that as well is creating the space for people to come and learn and volunteer and give back and feel a sense of belonging and um, give back to community as well. I'd have to say, um, <clears throat> Our volunteering program is one of our larger programs. And I think for me, I had, I've had i got a long um, history of working in the community not-for-profit sector. I've worked for World Vision, I've worked for the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation and a few other you know, different organisations. And I'd always worked with volunteers who I think in many cases were maybe students who were quite professional and they're kind of, you know, on their way up with their career. And they were doing it for that purpose, I guess. And so it was quite a learning for me and a bit of a challenge when I first started to understand that some of the volunteers that come and um, connect with Lechna are also kind of, can be seen as clients. You know, this is their family. This is a space for them to feel a sense of belonging and and hope and connection while they're also coming to give back to community. And I had, um, I had one quite hairy day 
um, Julie, the other manager that I work with, who has been at Lechner for a very long time, over 20 years, wasn't there. And we had one volunteer who's been with us for a long time, um, who has her own challenges. Um, she had a bit of a breakdown and she ran out on the road and I had to go and kind of rescue her. And I think it was that day I realised, ah, oh, the volunteers is a program. That's a program. <laughs> and Julie's my the manager that I work with, turned to me and said, if this particular volunteer and if maybe one or two other volunteers didn't have Lechner, they wouldn't be with us. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, they, they would have ended their lives. And I think it's been a journey for me. This is the first time I, in my role that I have worked in a community centre. I've been in the community sector a long time and it has really just blown me away with what it's capable of doing in terms of this place-based work. We have close to 40,000 people coming through our doors and that's also because we're a social enterprise and um, we do venue hire, but we have a lot of people coming every week for our programs. And I guess our reality is, as Anne alluded to, we scrabble around for funding. Um, and I have also worked in the, um, for the peak body for the alcohol and other, other drug treatment sector, um, CUNADA in Queensland, and community centres kept coming up, kept coming up, soft entry, you know, for people who have an alcohol and other drug issue, this is a, it's, there's no shame in turning up to a community centre for a program. And so even before I'd come and worked in a community centre, I saw the benefit and the importance of community centres. So. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of QCA's campaign to try and get some um, some funding, better funding for community centres in Queensland because I have had the opportunity to chat to people from other states and other the other peak bodies for community centres in other states and Queensland is probably the worst off at the moment in terms of what we get from state government to do what we do, do the important work that we do and um, yeah, I think build better lives is a good catchphrase. So thank you. Thanks, Gillian. Um, we've probably got a couple minutes for a few questions if you're happy to take them, Gillian. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you've got a question, maybe put it in the chat um, or kind of give me a bit of a wave. I don't have a question, but I'd, I'd um, probably like to second everything that both of the ladies have said. Um, I run a community centre in Townsville and the chronic underfunding severely impacts what we can and can't achieve, um, particularly in the disaster space. And I think that's um, it's, it's unfunded work that we do, but increasingly, particularly in North Queensland, it's, it's part of the expectation of the community centre role that we will respond in a disaster, but we have one funded person. We went through the floods last year. Our um, demand for services increased by 400% overnight. We got no extra funding immediately to deal with that need because we're the place that people come to. So in addition to the everythingness um, that you've heard about that community centres do, and we all do this in very different ways, the disaster impact and the increasing demand for those services, um, like that alone should fund a second person. So however mm -hmm. I can help, um, lobby the government to, I've, I've already lobbied the, the minister, who's actually a Townsville based minister for community services, just to say, hey, this is not, we, we can't, it's not even safe to have one person on site with the kind of work that we do. Um, but yeah, however I can help um, further this conversation, please let me know, because I have all of the data to prove exactly how underfunded we are, uh, just based on our experiences in the last 12 months. Um, I might I might message you, Sandra, because I'd like to get in touch. <laughs> I'll send you my email yeah. address. Yeah, that's amazing. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, because obviously that disaster responsiveness is a big issue for regional community centres. It's like a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, Sandra, I think you've been talking for a while, but you're on mute.
Sorry. Um, I was just saying that that disaster space has been written into our contract. So it's an expectation of our service delivery without any extra resourcing. And we're already overstretched and underfunded. Mm. Um, and particularly in the, you know, the COVID disaster for, for here um, has come right off the back of our, we're still in flood recovery. So we've got, you know, compounding disasters, which is something I think we can expect to see moving forward across all areas of Queensland and particularly Australia. Um, but that's something that we, we, we're already overstretched. So we definitely need to, to find some more permanent funding for that work. Mm, totally. It's not a good excuse for governments to be like, I don't want to do this work. I'll underfund someone else to do it badly. Like that's not, you know, yeah, that's, Thank you for sharing, Sandra and, and Gillian and Anne as well. Just um, a there's a question, question in the chat, uh, Marion. Oh, just a quick question. I don't know if I heard right, but on the news, um, it was announced that the government would be giving money to schools, but at the end of the sentence, they said school and community centres. Did anybody hear that and did I get it right? No, I didn't hear that. Mm. Maybe yes, I, to... I thought I heard the word in at schools and community service, so yeah. community mm. centres. I think there's some stimulus um, funding that's been announced that relates to like the bricks and mortar of community centres. And I, I think that probably highlights what where often the problem is where governments, uh, it, it's not like there's great physical resources everywhere but often they're more prepared to put it to that than actually to the, the staff to do the work of the, of the oh, um, no. because, so I think um, that's, that's, I think what the current um, announcement right. Right. Okay. is. The thing we would encourage that, but it, but it doesn't replace um, funding the, yes. the, the yeah. things that need to catalyze those other connections. Yeah. I'm going to hand over to Elise now to talk about um, what some of the solutions are to the challenges that community centres are currently facing. Hi everyone, so Elise is my name. I work with Deva and Emily at Queensland Community Alliance and um, we've been working really hard um, across different um, community neighbourhood centres and um, listening um, the you know people them, the community centers themselves have been discussing and negotiating with other people you know faith communities you know unions as part of the Queensland Community Alliance to reflect on what is it that moves move, will move forward this area we know it's deeply underfunded and it has been deeply underfunded for you know 20 years or so um so what Karen was saying Karen Dare from Communify this morning was saying that you know, it hasn't been, there's been no increase in substantial increase in neighbourhood centre funding for 20 years. And so I think Queensland Community Alliance is, is bringing together um, specific um, demands and specific asks for both the opposition leader and the premier to say, this doesn't just help the, you know, the, the people that are a part of the community centre. In fact, it can be a bedrock for, um, for all of us in, in the ways that our our different faith institutions interact with that, our cultural communities and others in terms of space, in terms of empowerment, in terms of resilience and all of that type of thing. So um, we've sort of figured out what, you know, what we, what we really want to see is um, an immediate injection into community centres. So um, we know through COVID um, that um, there will be um, big challenges for people. And so we need an investment into community centres as the backbone of community infrastructure. Um, we need to make sure that, you know, initially that they're supported. They're not like, um, you know, Sandra, that story about, you know, the disaster and how you're expected to just deal with it in Townsville. We've got the exact same thing coming up here. So. We want an initial injection of um, for each community centre to have somebody that can help navigate um, the people that walk through the door to make sure that they've got the services that they need. Then that will free up other resources for community centres um, to be able to prioritise to whatever that they wish, but guaranteeing that everybody who walks through the door will be connected up. That kind of helps the initial problem right of, of how to help people be more connected and, and, and give immediate support but there's a longer problem 
um, in this area to resolve, which is how do we move forward and ensure that government understand the importance of community infrastructure in, in through community centres? How do we help them see the value of it so that we don't have this um, continual de defunding of, of community centres? You know, they should be funded and understood to be an essential service, an essential part out of the budget um, that, that is re-evaluated and understood. So what we want is um, a, a co-design pilot where, you know, we hear from, um, we hear from people um, across um, Queensland as to what should be the priorities um, in seeing value for community centres and, and ensuring that that's done with government so that people, um, that government have an understanding of what community centres you know, do and, and where, where's the need? Um, and so that the, um, that's the first ask. The second one is then from that, be able to actually um, pilot different models of um, funding across different community centres. And um, I guess really experiment with, well, what, what, what you know, if, we, if we're picturing in 50 years time, the type of, you know, 20 years time, the type of community centres we're going to need. How do we co-design around that and then and then run trials that get us actually up to that and actually being a bit ambitious? And then after that, we want a full rollout um, where every, every community centre has extra resources um, to be able to do the work that they see as a priority for them, right? The worst thing ever is when government, you know, says you know this this is this is you know what we think the priority is and and that's not in, aligned to community's interest so the the final ask is really creating space for um creating space for what um community centers themselves determine the need to be um God, how much more time do i have emily uh you got about two and a half minutes perfect okay um so i guess the the final kind of um piece we want to add um, is just um, be able to, um, I'll just share my screen here. Um, share screen. Um, there. It really kind of the the um, idea around the, um, the rollout and the idea around um, the co-design process is understanding the different ways that community centres um, prioritise what they do in the community and that the community centres themselves should be able to articulate what the, the priorities are for their community um, in alignment with, um, with the stories of, of, of people around them. So we want to um, make sure that the, um, the co-design process, the, the initial trial and then the rollout is around some of these, these six areas here. So building financial and economic inclusion, meeting people's needs, creating and sustaining social connections and inclusion, personal development, family engagement, advocacy and community voice. And so that that extra funding is able to be um, chosen by the community centres themselves in alignment with what they want. But hopefully the co-design process also means that um, you don't have to keep fighting over what community centres are. There's an understanding of what it is and that the needs are met across Queensland in terms of, well, where are the gaps and do we need new community centres somewhere or, you know, is there, should, should other places be, have more resources, perhaps, you know, areas that are disaster prone, that type of thing. All right. I think that's Thank everything. You. Cool. Well, um, I'll invite some questions now. Go for it, Sandra. <laughs> Go, go, go. I'm just just wondering if um, this group, and excuse my ignorance, um, is linked in with the QFCA, doing some mapping about um, trying to actually map the value of community centres in in real dollar values. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. You both. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the group, because um, we understand that the 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 QFCA kind of recommendation was. Um, just flat out doubling community centre funding, um, but um, that we, we absolutely um, needs to have um, 
an injection of funds. Um, but the group that Queensland Community Alliance wanted to think about is how do we have a, a long-term vision for community centres? So even if you doubled the funding, you, you still need to have it, we need to sort of more deeply embed and give a, a consistent program logic that's across that's across um, community centres that, that means that it's, um, you know, every time you, you um, have to, um, you know, report back in terms of um, measures that of each centre. I know that that's a really onerous process, and so actually having a um, a, a consistent way and, and teaching government right that not every community centre is the same, and you can't just do this one size fits all kind of approach. But in fact, let's have something that's um, deeply resourced and something that's nuanced. And so we're definitely working with the QFCA on that um, and um, having. Um, having conversations about about the two things. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And can, can we just correct um, the the actual centre funding is one funded model, which is the hundred and twenty thousand per year per centre. It's it's nowhere near three million um, turnover for most small centres. Um, so it's one one hundred and twenty thousand per year with one funded worker, John. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, it's, yeah, massive amount of work. I guess the final piece I didn't talk much to is part of the the, the challenge is actually being able to give um, training and um, be able to really um, build capacity and um, build um, the power of community centres to be the voice of their community locally. And so the other part of the, the ask is around community, um, a community organising capacity fund to train 600 community workers and leaders over four years to be able to give community um, the skills to be able to actually um, not just advocate, but be able to really win the types of things that is needed locally, whether that be, um, you know, around um, you know, looking at needs um, that, that are, you know, within the suburb and being able to take that to, you know, local councillors or local MPs. Often we don't have the, um, the, the skills to be able to, to properly network and build the relationships across the community as bridge builders that we need and actually be able to um, really speak um, because so much of, um, of our um, communities are hamstrung by government funding and that type of thing. So being able to actually um, work together with others and help people um, have the actual skills and um, training that they that they desperately are after to be able to build upon the current work. Um, have a lovely week and I'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.